But my name is Nancy Norris Bauer, and I am the uh, state coordinator uh, for New Jersey History Day. And uh, so I know most of the people um, or many of the people who are already mm -hmm. logged on. Um, and I just want to thank uh, the students and the teachers and, and the judges for um, all the, the students for their research this year, the, the teachers for guiding them and the judges for working hard <laughs> to make decisions, which some of them are still doing right now. Um, for the state contest. So um, we're glad that you could join us today. Um, and uh, I also wanna thank um, Pete Canarosi from William Patterson, who's helping us with the technology today and the recording and, and so forth. I really appreciate his help. Um, so we're gonna ask everyone, I think uh, people are doing a great job now to stay on mute and then there'll be opportunities for questions when it, you can always put some questions in the chat or just take notes and when we have some opportunities throughout for questions just raise your hand and um and liz will call on you one of us will make we'll try to make sure we get to to all the questions so i'm really um excited to uh introduce dr Elizabeth Colton, um, Liz. Uh, I've actually known Liz for many, many years. Her parents were friends and mentors, and um, I've always been so impressed with her career. She uh, has had overlapping award-winning careers in diplomacy, international journalism, education, um, and now works promoting uh, diplomacy worldwide. Um, and um, I wanted to, uh, to mention that uh, a little bit about her uh, education, um, her background um, with, uh, she went to what was Randolph-Macon College, uh, Randolph College, um, and um, started off in six, and then at Vanderbilt University, um, she did two master's degrees. Uh, one in English literature and one in sociology, anthropology, and then her PhD from the London School of Economics um, in social anthropology. And um, so um, now just on and mention a couple of other things. Um, since 2016, she's worked as a UNITAR trainer in a variety of courses. She ser uh, serves as a diplomat and journalist in residence at Warren Wilson College, uh, which is uh, near Asheville, North Carolina, and as board chair of the Global Reporters Sands Frontiers um, with the USA and North America. She's a former UN development planner, Peace Corps volunteer, Emmy award-winning journalist in all the news media, including as a diplomatic correspondent, a retired U.S. Foreign Service officer, Fulbright Scholar, MacArthur Fellow in Globalization Studies, Press Secretary, Professor of Mass Communications, and author of two published books to date and numerous articles. So I feel like we're very fortunate to have her expertise I know she's worked hard on um, including a variety of components and I'm gonna turn it over to her uh, to add anything she wants to highlight that I didn't because the resume is very long that I didn't and um, we'll go from there. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. And thank you all for attending. Uh, truly, uh, ever since I was invited, ever since, uh, uh, the William Patterson University and, uh, and Nancy Bauer invited me to do this. I've been extremely excited about it, looking forward to today. Um, in fact, I was supposed to do something at Warren Wilson College in person today. I said, no, I'm sorry. Um, this is too important. I'd already made a commitment. And I want to congratulate all of you on uh, really what I understand is an, an, quite an outstanding and amazing uh, dynamic celebration and observance of National History Day with all of the work over the many months uh, in, in preparation for National History Day and New, New Jersey National History Day. 
Um, I think it's really uh, important and, and I congratulate all of you and congratulate the students who are involved, the teachers who've been encouraging, the judges who are very actively involved um, and all of us, you know, we want this to be a success and something my hunch is, uh, looking back on my own life, is that your, uh, to you students, um, that your experience in this National History Day on everything you've done uh, is going to have a big impact the rest of your life. And someday you'll be giving speeches like I'm giving today and you'll say, I look back, you know, when I was in uh, middle school or high school. And uh, there was something very important that happened in my life. And that was my participation um, and competing in uh, National History Day. So I congratulate you all. Um, Nancy, if you could put up the slide that shows the four sections, I'll just give you a rundown on uh, what I'm planning to do. It, this is a, a long period of time. I realize it's, it's two hours from four to six, but uh, I, think, um, I think that you'll, uh, enjoy this and I hope my hope is that I'm going to inspire you and encourage you and very importantly I hope to give you a a broad a picture of diplomacy that you you may not know at all you probably don't know a lot that I'm going to be telling you at the same time I'm going to give you a lot of particular uh, aspects of diplomacy um, that I hope will excite you and interest you in diplomacy uh, as, as Nancy Bauer mentioned, I now spend a good bit of my time, whether teaching, speaking, writing, giving talks, you know, local talks, global talks, promoting diplomacy. Because quite honestly, uh, I think from the beginning of my life, I, I was very interested in diplomacy. My mother had wanted to be a diplomat. She later did some diplomatic work um, she had been a code breaker in the Second World War, and I think probably when I was even a baby, she must have talked to me about diplomacy and the value of the United Nations, and somehow I had this idea. I wanted to be a diplomat. I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I wanted to, be, I wanted to work at the UN. I wanted to go around the world and have adventures, um, and actually I've done all of these things, so I... And it was difficult. It wasn't easy, because especially uh, at the time that I was growing up, uh, especially as a female, when a lot of things were closed. At any rate, I have just divided today's talks, and we will have a break. Uh, after one, we will also have time for questions. But the first section is what I've called diplomacy, history, war, debate, and peace. <laughs> That's everything. But it gets in, uh, of course, the importance of the, the theme for this year's National History Day, which is, as you know, debate and diplomacy in history. So I'm going to start in a minute, but I'm going to go through the fourth section just so you know what we're going to be doing. The second se is, uh, section, I'm going to focus on diplomacy and the news, diplomacy and the news media and interrelationship. Uh, and I'm going to talk more there about public and cultural diplomacy, and, and which includes many, many kinds of diplomacy. Section, we'll take a break after that, a, a five minute break, and then we will go into section three, uh, which, which I call global diplomacy, which I've, I've actually coined the phrase global diplomacy. I wrote an article about it in 2013, which we will put the link up but um, I use the expression and I'll explain more about it. So I call this global diplomacy and citizen diplomacy, the role of citizen diplomats. And I would add here the role of citizen diplomats and you, it's very important. I have, uh, this is something I really believe in. And section four, we'll talk about the different kinds of diplomacy pathways and careers, uh, professional diplomatic careers and many other careers that are involved with diplomacy, sort of to open up the whole world to you to see that you might be practicing diplomacy in many, many fields. So we'll get to that and we'll talk about the training you might need or not need. Um, I, I think you're getting the training right now. 
So let's go, um, let's look first at diplomacy, uh, war, and uh, diplomacy, history, war, debate, and peace. What is diplomacy? Uh, I'm sure you've all been focusing on this and you have many, many definitions, but I'm going to show you, if you don't know, there's an amazing book here called The Diplomat's Dictionary. It's by a friend of mine, who's also a retired foreign service officer. Uh, he was retired ambassador, he, uh, Chaz W. Freeman Jr. And he put together this huge book of uh, Diplomat's Dictionary. In this dictionary, I mean, there are, there are definitions of many words and terms that are used in, in diplomacy, but there are pages, literally pages of different definitions of diplomacy. So I'm sure that for many of you, you've been, you've thought, well, what is diplomacy? Some say this, some say that. I will tell you um, what I think of as diplomacy. And as I said, there are many, many uh, definitions. But for me, diplomacy, and I would expect for most of you, is uh, involves the activities that work for peace and peaceful settlements between groups of people or between individuals. And that the that diplomacy is involves nonviolent uh, activities. I would add just and I will do this throughout, you know, when you say that, it doesn't mean that it's not involved with the military. The military may be undergirding the diplomacy of a country, um, as in our own country. Uh, there are very few countries in the whole world, I mean, Costa Rica is one that comes right to mind, that, have, that do not have a military. But most countries, so diplomacy is not necessarily separate from it, may be held up by uh, strong militaries. Uh, and th that's a question, of course, for great discussion. The fact is that diplomacy is, involves the activities that work to bringing about peaceful settlements between groups. It doesn't mean, of course, that you're in complete agreement on everything. It also doesn't mean that maybe one side gets more than another. Uh, and and is and may be the case, but it involves, as we know, many many activities and 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 efforts at reaching consensus or agreement of some kind. And for the title of your National History Day, De debate and diplomacy in history, I would say that diplomacy is almost always involving debate of some kind. And uh, diplomatic activities uh, include debate, and they and and you can say diplomacy is debate. So there's there are many ways of looking at this, but the main thing is that I believe it's the effort to reach out uh, from one group to another group, to to make peaceful settlements and not violent uh, war solutions. Now. That goes to a point, I'm using this first section be, uh, to sort of to explain some very foundational ideas that I think are important that we get, I, I think everybody gets often con confused because you read uh, newspaper articles or, or online, of course, that, that they say something like, now uh, diplomacy ends as war begins. That's, you know, and you think, okay, so now diplomacy, there's no diplomacy. Well, that is absolutely not true. And I'm sure that you all in your classes have discussed this. Diplomacy, if it's, if, and it, and, and I believe diplomacy is always going on. It may sometimes be going on uh, more or more strongly at, than at other times. And you will right now uh, with the situation in the world, you will read diplomacy has come to a standstill or diplomacy, where's diplomacy? I believe as someone who has been, who has been both a diplomat, but also I was a diplomatic reporter and a correspondent who covered diplomacy and I covered war. 
I, I was a war correspondent and a diplomatic correspondent. From, being, from covering wars and diplomacy, I can tell you that it's much easier to cover wars than it is to cover diplomacy. And we're gonna talk more about that in the second section about why that is. So we'll come back to that, but I'll throw that out right now. What I would like to note that right at the beginning, and some of you probably have thought of this, but we're talking about history as at, at this, in this particular, on this particular occasion, National History Day, and I'm sure you go into, of course, you know, what is prehistory and what about the beginnings of time of, of human beings when human beings began, uh, became human beings. Um, I genuinely believe, if you think about it, that diplomacy was the first activity, the first kind of activity that made us human beings in the sense of having human societies that interacted one group with another group. So if you think about it, for the one group to reach out to the other group in some way, that was diplomacy. So if in that case, and you think of it, then diplomacy is, is really kind of the most basic kind of human behavior that, I mean, which breaks down as we know for often, but it was the human behavior that reached out to another group. And I'm going to come back to this more in the second section, but I would like to say also making this statement that public diplomacy, and that means anything, any kind of diplomacy that is public and and out to the public. Nowadays, of course, it's newspapers, it's online, it's digital, um, but public diplomacy began also at the very beginning because one group would know that somebody from their group went to speak to another group to try to bring peace or to welcome them and say, come eat food with us, come eat our food, don't be distrustful, we will not, we will not poison you, eat, eat with us, come dance with us. And then ultimately, of course, it meant marriage uh, uh, and uh, between groups. And some anthropologists have said that marriage uh, was the first kind of human behavior. But I would say it goes back before the marriages happened, it was diplomacy that led to those connections. And so therefore, we're also talking about public diplomacy because it, it's in view, everyone knows something is going on publicly between two groups. And it's also another term, which we use a lot, and I teach a public diplomacy and cultural diplomacy, but the other is cultural diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy is almost any kind of interaction which has a goal of bringing about a, a strong relationship between two countries or between two international organizations or reaching out to bring the whole world into international organizations. And cultural diplomacy could be almost anything. But if you go back to the very beginning of time, the very first kinds of cultural diplomacy would have been send, send a group of dancers from one side to another side to perform, send athletes, send orators, speakers. Somebody gives a speech over there, they send another orator back. All of that kind of interaction at the very beginning and continuing today means you have to trust. You have to be able to trust. Um, so when you talk about diplomacy, I think, and I want to say before we even talk about news or anything like that per se, it's extremely important to realize that diplomacy does not end when war begins. War becomes the dominant, but there's some kind of diplomacy usually, I mean, almost always, certainly going on, maybe not between the two countries uh, in, in the case of two nation states, but there's probably, there may be side meetings. And I think we see today, for example, again, with all these headlines saying diplomacy had ended, it didn't end. Uh, we've just had, uh, we had a, a release of two hostages 
somebody who was being held, a prisoner in Russia, an American, and some Russian who was being held in the United States. They were exchanged today. So, but you didn't, we didn't know everything going on until it made the news, which I'm going to get more into later. So let's see if we, if we look at these uh, few photos that I had and I'll just speak to them and then I'll see if there are any quick questions. Um, I, I just picked these out for particular reasons. Uh, the one of the Camp David Treaty signing in 1979, uh, was the Egyptian president Anwar Sadat uh, uh, and the Israeli uh, prime minister M Menachem Begin. And they were witnessed by and brought together by the United States president, Jimmy Carter. And this photograph that you see is one that you often see. But the, the sad thing is really that that's all you see unless you become a historian and you read about how it happened. And the fact of the matter is that that photograph represents years and years of very intense diplomacy and extremely intense diplomacy um, from, uh, from uh, September of 1978, when Jimmy Carter brought these two leaders who had been at war for at least four major wars, and uh, many, many other, you know, violent conflicts between them, uh, Israel and, and Egypt over decades. And Jimmy Carter brought them to Camp David, Maryland. And then, then the, after he brought them together and sort of bashed heads and, mean, and sort of said, okay, you have to talk with each other, we're here. And then they went back to their countries and nothing happened for many months. And then suddenly, and that was September of 1978, died down, other things happened in the world, but the diplomacy was going on. And in, then in February of 1979, suddenly President Carter announced that he was going out himself from Washington to Egypt and to Israel to try to get this going again. And he did. And then a few weeks later, in uh, I believe in the end of March of 1979, they actually signed uh, the accord. And then they also signed, I was there, I actually covered this. It was one of the first things as a young uh, journalist, I was with NBC News at the time. Uh, I was sent out to Egypt to participate in all the coverage. And they signed in Israel, they signed in, in Egypt. And they also then came and signed at the White House as with the witness. And so this was all diplomacy, but it was it's sort of left to history as one big picture. And then you have to know it wasn't just wars going on, but it was diplomacy going on. Uh, the other picture, the photograph I show here is the uh, UN General Assembly last September. And the, uh, as many of you may know, I hope you know, the president of the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly uh, last, from last September and still now, uh, and serves for one year is um, is actually the foreign minister of the Maldives, which is in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And this his this is uh, UN General Assembly President Abdullah Shahid. Uh, he is the foreign minister of Maldives, and I happen uh, to know him and I know his country very well because my PhD anthropological fieldwork was in the Maldives back in the 70s when no one knew even what the Maldives, where it was or what, or they didn't know much about it at all. And the country, which is non-aligned and always tries to maintain neutrality because it's so important as a tiny country uh, to, to have neutrality um, that, and now they've worked up and he's now the president. Something happened yesterday again you're reading in the news, no diplomacy, war in, in Europe, but diplomacy is going on. Yesterday, a very important thing happened in the UN General Assembly for diplomacy. Another little tiny country, uh, Liechtenstein, uh, um, the, their rep permanent representative to the UN General Assembly uh, had been working on very, for, for some months, 
um, an, an idea of trying to change the system. It's not changed yet, but it's moving forward. The idea, and there was consensus yesterday, that there may be some limitation to the veto power of the five major uh, this, uh, uh, Security Council members, that they would be held accountable. This is a major diplomatic breakthrough. It happened yesterday. Well, it didn't, it was announced yesterday, but the work was going on for many months. So th this kind of a breakthrough is very important, but you can see how it's hard to cover. And that's why it's very hard as a historian or, or as someone who's interested in current events to know what's happening because we don't get the news of it. And I also then put the insignia of the United Nations uh, because, uh, you know, in spite of all kinds of criticism for the United Nations, it's still quite a remarkable um, uh, organization for bringing the world together. And it's a center for debate and diplomacy, diplomacy and debate. So let me just stop a minute and see if there's any quick question, and then I will go into my next section. Any questions? You don't have to, and if, if you don't mind, if you would identify yourself and, and you know, your school or um, your name and your school, and then and ask a very brief question uh, related to the, what we've just discussed. But if, if, if there is none, we can go on. What do you think, Nancy? Do we have any? I, I was just trying to scroll through and see if I saw any raised hands. Yeah. That's um, right. But I don't, so maybe we'll just move on and okay. um, we'll give them another opportunity. Yeah, so let's go to uh, the next slide. In this section, section two, we're gonna discuss diplom more discuss, uh, diplomacy and the news and I, I'm here to tell you that diplomacy and the news are completely intertwined. You, in the 21st section, uh, 21st, 21st century, um, there's no diplomacy ultimately that can happen. A lot can be secret, a lot can be kept, uh, you know, covered only because nobody's interested in covering it. Um, but the fact is that it can become public and therefore, uh, there is a very complex interrelationship between diplomacy and the news and the news media. And that also involves what I just referred to in my first section about public and cultural diplomacy. So someone in public diplomacy and also cultural diplomacy, uh, cultural diplomacy is, is a kind of public diplomacy, although it's, it's considered separate in, in many ways, it uses the same tools, which are the media um, and different and having uh, educational exchanges and exhibitions and uh, dance performances, all kinds of things. And it's done in public. So, and it uses the tools, as I said, with the, with the traditional media um, of, of speeches and broadcast and print media and then also the new media, the social media and all digital media. So, but the people involved tr in the traditionally uh, in the last, and really the last half of the 20th century uh, were people in public affairs and cultural diplomacy. And they were the most actively involved with, with the news media and even up till the end, I mean, in, as a generalization, uh, uh, up till the end of the uh, 20th century, just as we were getting into uh, electronic media and, and uh, internet, uh, many, many diplomats traditionally felt that they did not have to be involved in any way with the news and they could avoid journalists and they could avoid uh, public uh, statements or anything. Um, many times they suffered because of this, because something would come up and they had to speak uh, to someone in the media. But now in the 21st century already, I, 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 
and as I teach this around the world for the United Nations uh, and different international universities, the people are, it doesn't matter what kind of diplomat they are, it's very likely they're going to have to deal with the media at some point. And it's very helpful to have training for these people to have training in dealing, in dealing, with, the, um, in dealing with the media. So as a journalist, as I mentioned, I covered war and I covered diplomacy. The, and why don't we uh, look at the, uh, we'll look at the uh, slides that I have here. Um, I, I, I'm segued straight from the UN General Assembly, the, the president, you can see him in the middle here, Abdullah Shahid from the Maldives. Um, he actually is one of the most, in my opinion, and I've been watching ever since he came in last year, um, and I knew, knew him before. Uh, he has taken, he has made his presidency of the UN General Assembly very public. If you follow any uh, of the social media, if you go, you will find UN General Assembly president, um, you will find on, you know, Twitter, uh, the TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, everything you could name, you will find him out there promoting all of his meetings. He puts them out in the public. He talks about him. And when he became, when he was sworn in or last September as the new president, he actually even gave it a slogan, the name for his presidency. And this is very, as you know, this is shows someone who's very aware of the media. And you can see it's called uh, Presidency of Hope, 70, 70 Succession of the UN General Assembly. That is his, he calls his presidency, the Presidency of Hope. And you can see by the image here, he's in this picture, he's got a photograph of himself last September with the six female, world leaders who came to the General Assembly uh, at the opening of the General Assembly. And you see the, he obviously he has a great sense of, of media and imaging and, and also of important issues that he wants to focus on. Uh, one of them being uh, getting uh, women and, and uh, non-binary, everybody much more involved in diplomacy in the UN General Assembly. Um, and it's, it's very important what he's doing in that. And it's, frankly, it's, it's unusual. Let's go to the next one. Then I'll just show uh, just briefly a couple. This was uh, my, I, this was me. I mean, I was not a soldier. Uh, if you look, you can see there, uh, uh, the, the surrender flags. These, this was in the Desert Storm War uh, in 1991 in, uh, well, this picture was in Saudi Arabia because these are Iraqi soldiers who had deserted from Iraq. They had been in Kuwait and they were coming over. This is the desert. You can see the desert. It looks like an ocean there. And the reason I have on a uniform was that I was up, I was a one of the few journalists who was up at the front in the war. And we met, we being some journal, the few journalists, we met some soldiers and they gave us little pieces of uniform. For example, my helmet there doesn't have a cover on it. And so I, you know, I kind of looked funny, but at any rate, the reason we, we got the pieces of the uniform was to be camouflaged in the desert. Uh, this story, uh, when the Iraqi soldiers surrendered, uh, they came across the desert and I was with uh, two uh, a Italian cameraman and a Spanish photographer. And we knew we had to go see these people. And because we saw them coming, we did not know if they were armed. Um, and then we said, they said, you know, I said, why are, why are you, why are you leaving? Why did you leave? They said, we're hungry, we're tired. And so we gave them uh, some, some cookies and they gave us some dates uh, from their pockets. Um, anyway, this was a very powerful picture. So this was covering war. And I would mention that uh, 
I, I have been under bombs. I've, I've felt I've been with bombs falling when I was a war correspondent. But the best part of covering the wars, I must say, was you know this kind of story. Or for example, the next day after this was when the people came out of their houses and they'd been liberated and they began dancing in the streets in Kuwait. And then we'll see the other two pictures. But this is just to give you an idea of, of the relationship of a journalist trying to, trying to cover diplomacy and war uh, in, the, in, these, in these situations. Uh, this was, this was uh, here I am, uh, I was interviewing uh, President Saddam Hussein uh, way back uh, in the 1980s, and uh, that I was having an interview. And this was, of course, at the time before uh, relations between Iraq and the United States fell apart. They were not great, uh, but they were, they were good enough, uh, you know, that he welcomed, in this case, an American journalist. But there were many, many situations that I, as a journalist, covered in diplomacy and wars in which the United States did not have good uh, relationships with, with the country. And the next one, we'll see. This uh, situation in, in the next leader, this is, uh, you might have heard of him, uh, the students, you might have heard. This was Libya's leader, Muammar Gaddafi, and um, I, managed to get an interview with him. You can see his bodyguard there, a, a, a female bodyguard. And it was out in the desert. You can see it's just a grass thing around, around and we're in the middle of the desert. Um, and the point being, it didn't matter that I was an American. I mean, at that point, when I interviewed him, uh, the United States had uh, cut off its relationship with Libya, uh, but still, the news was going on. And there, at that point, I will say, this was before ultimately uh, uh, the United States bombed Libya about five years after this, but there was, it was a debate for a long time. Unfortunately, the debate broke down and uh, there was war. So, uh, but there was the debate and there were diplomatic efforts in many ways They continued. Um, Finally, I have to say, I'm very, very glad that right now they're, they're, they're building very good relations between the United States and Libya and elsewhere. But at any rate, that just gives you a picture of a journalist who is in a country where my country didn't have any kind of relations at that time. If, when you think of, now go back to the uh, section two uh, title there. Back to the, yeah, good. Um, I would like to just give, uh, I'm gonna tell a, a uh, well, let me ask if there are any questions now, and then I'm going to tell a short uh, a story uh, that gives you an example of all these kind of interrelationships with the, between news and diplomacy. Any questions? I, I want to be sure we get them if you have them at, at that, at some point, but we don't have to. If you if you have a question, just unmute and, and ask. And if not, uh, we'll give you another opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I, I would like to tell you, uh, just to give you an idea of what a diplomat can do, um, because I think in reading a lot of history, you may just unfortunately we get the idea that it's just these very high level you know uh events where people sign treaties or get together and i'm sure you've done much more research than just that but i think that photograph that i showed we showed of um for the camp david treaty uh sort of sig is a significant photograph that's a, a very uh, usual kind of photograph of diplomacy the story I'm going to tell you, we don't have any pictures, I mean, at, at this point. But I was in Sudan. I, the United States did not have good relations at the time with Sudan. This was uh, back in uh, 2005. And the, we, we, in fact, the United States had imposed sanctions. Um, and I would 
add that personally, I'm not such a big fan of, of sanctions, but the sanctions were in place. And one of our jobs in the embassy, as I was then with the US Foreign Service as a diplomat, I was, I was head of, I was chief of public affairs in the embassy in Khartoum, which of course rip, covered the whole of Sudan. And uh, one of our diplomatic goals was to co constantly be in communication with the Sudanese, our counterparts and, and people um, to try to have the country work to get rid of the sanctions. And as you know, sanctions uh, are imposed uh, and, and, and uh, put, put on another country uh, in, in the case of the United States by the Congress. And so if once sanctions are imposed, as we've seen that are going on now, it's, it's very difficult to lift the sanctions unless you know you can just say okay we're going to but that's it's very difficult so the effort has to be to try to get the country that you've put the sanctions on to do everything they can uh, to have the sanctions lifted and that you know would mean in in the case of, uh, of of the United States of asking other countries to show signs of more uh, of having more freedoms or something um, so. One day uh, in Washington, this is 2005, um, the Secretary of State, uh, Condoleezza, Dr. Condoleezza Rice, who was a, a, a just a, had just come in as Secretary of State, uh, had been a, I had known her before. I used to interview her as a, when I was diplomatic correspondent for National Public Radio. But at this point, she was by then Secretary of State and I was by then a US diplomat. And she was in Washington and she was in her limousine uh, or on the way to uh, Congress to testify before Congress on general um, appropriations of money and of financing for the State Department and for foreign policy and, and dip uh, diplomatic activities. On her way, she suddenly got the news, which we began hearing all over the wor world. Uh, there was a big news story that a, some guards in the US uh, military uh, prison in Guantanamo had destroyed the sacred Qurans of, of the Islamic faith. And so this was a terrible story and it was very damaging of, to the United States. That, that guards who worked for the United States government were destroying Qurans, the holy, holy um, uh, text. And so Dr. Rice, Condoleezza Rice, the Secretary of State immediately wrote out a little speech that she told her people. She said, I'm going to address this immediately before I talk to Congress about the appropriations and the money. Uh, so she started, she, and this was afternoon, and it was significant because for me, it was nighttime in Sudan. I didn't know right then and there what had happened. Uh, she started, she addressed it. She said, the United States is completely against such activities. We completely condemn the desecration of the Quran or any sacred text. We believe in freedom of religion. This is part of our First Amendment, our Constitution. Our, our rights, our freedoms. And so she made a very strong, short statement. The next morning, very early, I came into my office as the public affairs uh, chief there in Khartoum in the embassy. And I'm reading, catching up on whatever news overnight I read. And, and I saw that, that the Secretary of State had made this statement. Fortunately, I saw it. And just at that moment, I had someone coming into my office, one of my Sudanese assistants and colleagues who was working in the embassy. He said, there's a huge demonstration now of protesters who are coming towards the embassy. They've crossed the Nile from the Islamic University, which was on the other side of the Nile in Khartoum, the Nile River. And they were on their way. And of course, I'm sure some of you have seen, you've, you've seen when embassies have been taken and uh, you, you've read about the uh, U.S. Embassy in Iran in 1979 and, 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 the, and being taken over. So it was not a 
a very happy idea for us to suddenly, we're gonna be surrounded with protesters storming against the embassy. Well, I quickly asked my assistant, I showed him the, the little statement that the Secretary of State had made. And I asked, I said, please translate this English into Arabic and let's have about 10 or 15 copies of the English and the Arabic of the, her statement. And it wasn't a long statement, but we got it translated. In the meantime, I ran down the hall in the embassy to see the charge d'affaires. That means the person in charge because we didn't have a, an, an ambassador because relations were not that good. So we, the United States said, we won't have an ambassador. We'll have only a charge d'affaires. And the charge d'affaires, that means in charge of affairs um, from the French, I went to him and I said, look, the, there are hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know, protesters are coming to storm the embassy now and to demand um, some kind of statement uh, from us about this, uh, the desecration of the Quran in Guantanamo, you know, all the way in the Caribbean. And I, I said, look, I think we should welcome them. Why don't we, instead of, you know, closing all the doors, why don't we uh, go out and, and welcome, and maybe we could bring the leaders in and we could speak to them. I was thinking he and I would do that. He said, <laughs> he said, that's a great idea, Liz, you can do that. Why don't you do it? And we'll send, and you'll have a security guard. And so we went out, the security um, guards went out and asked the, the leaders who were, you know, in flowing robes. And uh, these were leaders from the Islamic University, but many, many people had joined this protest and they were surrounding the embassy. So they said, come in because our chief of public affairs would like to welcome you and uh, to give you a statement. Well, of course, you can imagine these people were very surprised. <laughs> and, but they came in and my uh, Sudanese with the Sudanese assistant with me, um, who was working in the embassy, uh, he had the translated and we handed them. And I said, at first, I want to welcome you. I said, I also want to tell you that it is very important what you're doing because in our own constitution and our United States constitution, and of course this was a form of diplomacy to talk about this. I said, you are practicing peaceful assembly and that's in our first amendment that people have the right to peaceful assembly and to call for redress to, to their governments. So I said, and it's also related to freedom of religion and I said, here is what the Secretary of State, our foreign minister has said, that the United States uh, uh, is, is completely with you and we completely condemn the desecration of any sacred text, including the Quran or any other. Um, so we chatted for a few minutes and then because they were, most of these leaders were from the Islamic University. Uh, of the big university in, in Khartoum. And I said, you know, we have uh, had a few programs with you all, but it's very important if we can establish more educational exchanges, which of course, educational exchanges are cultural diplomacy. So we, we established a little relation that day and it continued afterwards. They went outside, they told everybody. Everybody was, of course, I'm sure people were surprised and probably disappointed that there wasn't more drama. And the fact of the matter was that you have never seen a movie of this, uh, of the drama, because we, we managed diplomatically, starting with the Secretary of State's foreign policy statement to Congress on this, on this news issue. And then my following up and our embassy following up, following up, you didn't have a big movie about this, but the fact was, that we established relations at this point, and it was diplomatic and it was face to face, but it was also using public media and public. We went out. We had we had statements to the to the radio stations and the television stations and the newspapers in uh, and sent out online statements uh, at that time. So we did have some news for two or three days. As I said, it didn't make the big news in history. Uh, but I can say I was very proud of this because it showed di dipl diplomacy at work. It showed following from the statement by the Secretary of State in this case, 
taking it, using it in a local situation in the case of Sudan and bringing all of this together. And so I would say to you, this is diplomacy. And this was, it gave me great joy and you can tell it gives me great joy to share this story with you. So I'll stop here and see if anybody has questions um, thinking about diplomacy in the news or the beginning of what we talked about of diplomacy uh, from the beginning of time in human society or public diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, whatever. Any questions? Okay, um, so uh, Charlie has raised his hand. You wanna, uh, um, I, can you unmute? Yeah, and I'd like to be able to see, I'm trying to see if I can see. Go ahead, Charlie, and not unmute your mic. Um, I just had a question. You did a lot of like things that sound a little dangerous to try and cause <laughs> diplomacy. Did you ever worry about like what negative consequences could come from that? Uh, yes, of course. And, um, but I will say to you that one of my feelings is that it, I am, I was always very careful. Uh, I certainly took care. I thought about things, but I certainly am a believer that, that we should not. And, and it's become a problem often with United States diplomacy and is criticized. Uh, that's become kind of what we call a bunker mentality or fortress mentality, uh, that everybody's in the fortress and, you know, d we don't go out. Well, that's not true of all American diplomats. I will say that there's always, there are always many American diplomats who do continue to have outreach face-to-face -face in public. And, and, and I think you can do that in most of the countries where I happen to work in the short time that I was in the foreign service. Uh, and I was, it was because of a mandatory retirement age that I had to retire, which I didn't, wasn't keen to do. But the fact was that I was always, I was in countries often where I had to have bodyguards. Um, and so, but I would arrange to go out and I would be accompanied, you know, maybe by a bodyguard, but people where I went, the, the, uh, the people of the country, and I would go all over the country, all over these countries. I was in, I was posted in my time in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain, in, uh, in Sudan, in Algeria, in Egypt twice, and in Pakistan twice, in Islamabad, in Karachi, um, and in Iraq, in Baghdad, and, and all over. In all of those places, I managed to go around. Um, I think you just have to, you have to work within limits and you have to be careful. But I don't think that a, as a diplomat, this is my view, uh, is that we should put our heads down and never go out and meet people. Uh, in that case, in the case of the story I told you, uh, obviously, if it had been, if they had determined, the security people, if they had determined it was super violent and very dang, too dangerous, I probably, I certainly wouldn't have been allowed to go out or have them inside. But it seemed that we had an opportunity that this, they were, they were attempting to have a peaceful protest and a peaceful uh, assembly uh, and demonstration. And it, as we know, it can always erupt into something else, but at least we, we took the chance and there were only say the five leaders who came inside and, and we, were, we were meeting at the, at the, at the gate in, inside. So um, anyway, it, it, it worked out. And I have been in other situations um, when, for example, in Egypt at the time of revolution, the uh, Arab Spring Revolution in 2011, and I was a uh, press attache and spokesperson for the whole embassy and all over Egypt. Um, in that case, we didn't, I happened to be work, I was inside, there were only a few diplomats inside when it, it started on the Friday. Um, we stayed inside at that point. But within a few days, I was able to go out and see some of the demonstrations and speak to people on the street. Uh, and I was often accompanied with guards. So yeah, it, it can be, but I, 
I think that if a person goes into uh, diplomatic work, uh, I think they need to 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 be willing to to try. Does that help? Does that answer? This yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question, because of course it's absolutely completely right on kind of question. Are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? I think who asked the question and I appreciated the question. Thank you. There's uh, Christy Morello, where, where are you? Where are you? Where, where is your school? Hey. And my school is in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. Char Charlie's one of my students. The girl okay. that, asked, yeah, that asked the question. They're so yeah. excited. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, well, that's fabulous. And so tell me, are, do you have a whole course on this or are you just folk and add this to the history part? So actually, my National History Day. It's a club, but I mm. do use a lot of the teaching, a lot of the things of National History Day within my teaching. And wow. the kids volunteer, essentially, like they do this for no credit, no extra credit, but for the love of history. So they were yeah. so excited by today's opportunity. Well, as I said, I, I honestly, and you know this, but I, I certainly think that the experience that they're having through this year doing this is, is going to last a lifetime. I I absolutely agree. I've been doing NHD for 15 years and it's truly a transformative experience. Yeah, it's wonderful. So I'm so proud of all of our kids from all of New Jersey. They're tremendous. Yeah, and um, I think if we, uh, uh, Nancy, you could also put my uh, email. I don't mind people writing me later, Liz Colton at Yahoo. Um, and I'd love to know about your your programs and, and your having a na National History Day club sounds wonderful. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So and do you teach history or other subjects? I do. I teach history. Um, I teach American history uh, right now, eighth grade, but I've taught pretty much everything seven through 12 in college. OK, <laughs> great. And I see Aiden Crowley, too. No, is, is that who is Aiden Crowley? Yeah, uh, where's your school? Hey. Hi, this is Rebecca McClellan Crawley. Aiden's my son. We're on his Zoom, so we're on the oh, okay. Uh, no, we're in West Windsor Plainsboro, and okay. my students are joining us, as well as my own two children. Oh, so wonderful, wonderful. I'm trying to learn some better diplomacy skills. We've been yeah. mute the whole time saying, this is what the world needs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the next section is, is really going to be very directed uh, is, you know, it's 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 about every it's about everyone. And I believe it. And, and I think it's so important uh, that people don't think diplomacy is something that's just out removed and, you know, stuffy people doing it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Great. And your name's Rebecca Crowley. Yes, I'm Rebecca. <laughs> okay, good. And you teach history and other courses? And Aiden. There's my son. Okay. We're all blurred out in the background. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm a little foggy. <laughs> a foggy day here in middle yeah, Great. Uh, I teach gifted and talented enrichment. So the students can participate in National History Day, uh, problem solving groups, engineering mm -hmm. groups, poetry. Wow. Lots of different choices. Excellent. Okay. Fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Nancy, shall we start? I think everybody's back. I think so. I think we should go ahead. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Uh, welcome back to everyone. And I hope uh, that all of you will be thinking ab about questions because now much of what we're going to do in the second hour is really directed to each of you, to all of us, in, in a variety of ways. And our first section is going to be about what I call local diplomacy and also cit uh, citizen diplomacy, which is, is now becoming more accepted uh, and recognized worldwide. Um, I would say that there are probably some 
professional official diplomats who maybe don't count it very much, but I count it. And I believe that the role of citizen diplomats uh, is, 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 is extremely important in the whole world and it affects you and it's something that you already can be at any age and throughout your life and throughout your careers. So let's look at first at uh, global diplomacy is a term that I came up with just to say to explain, I like the word global and you, you, you've heard that word uh, global, meaning that what is happening at the local level is, has an impact in the outer, the big world, the global level, and what happens globally, of course, affects locally. And we all know about this in many ways, uh, and we see it happening, but I then talked about global diplomacy, and I did it, I used it, and if you read the little article I wrote, which was not an academic article, it was written actually in a local magazine in Western North Carolina, and I wrote it so that people could think about, you know, what individual roles are and city roles and regional roles are for diplomacy in promoting um, what I would say are positive values uh, from the local level out to the world. And uh, as an example, uh, there happened to be uh, someone here in Western North Carolina, uh, it turned, a, a friend of mine now, uh, she started something which some of you may know about called Bee City USA, B-E-E -E for, the, for the insect. Uh, and she started to, you know, to help save bees in the world. Well, this has now become, and so she took this little idea in the town city where I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and she started building it out across the United States first, and now it's globally. And it's, it's, it's a real example of global diplomacy and citizen diplomacy in which someone starts with a very, uh, an important idea to reach out to the world in, a, in diplomatic ways, peaceful ways, nonviolence, uh, ideals of bringing people together, in this case, uh, to save uh, to help save bees. And as you know, this has, uh, you know, got a lot of world attention now. And even it has attention of, of UNESCO. And UNESCO is the biggest global organization for preservation of, of, of um, natural, of, of, of heritage sites, of cultural heritage, national heritage sites. And those national heritage sites can also include in the case bees, animals, uh, natural wonders, um, as well as buildings. And, and it also includes ways of living and ways of expressing and cooking and, and, and sewing. It, it, it includes all of this is diplomacy. And I would like to give you, so I mentioned UNESCO, that's at the global level, but the little level of your school in New Jersey, you can start something with an idea and it, you can build it out to the world. You start it in a diplomatic way and you use all the tools that public diplomacy uses now, meaning media, speeches, take the speeches, put them on the social media, quotes from the speeches. Um, it is the way on social media, get interviews in the newspaper or online papers or television, radio. Uh, podcast, anything, um, and you can use it then to get your ideas out. So global diplomacy, in my view, is what citizen diplomacy can be. In other words, citizen diplomacy, they're not necessarily totally different. Citizen diplomacy means that a citizen or citizen, uh, plural, come up with an idea for making the world a better place. And you started at your little tiny local level, on your street, in your neighborhood, in your house, in your school. And it goes, it can just go out like that. Um, I realize <laughs> this is very idealistic, 
but honestly, it's working and it's happening. And so one of the things I'm hoping today is that while I talked about the big kind of diplomacy and big peace treaties and the big United Nations and the huge UNESCO, I'm also talking about you in your town, in your city, in your school, your home, starting from home and building something as a citizen. And uh, personally, right now, I would say that I am practicing at all times citizen diplomacy by my citizen diplomacy is to promote diplomacy as, as probably about the best thing that can be done in the world um, if we practice diplomacy. That's my belief. Um, and it, you may have something else. You would have other things. So I would encourage you to start, as I'm talking, to start thinking about, well, maybe I can start something. Now, it's very important to say that many people have started citizen diplomacy activities and they did not plan to go to the whole world. They were just doing it locally. Like my friend with the B City USA, she just started it. She didn't realize it was gonna end up being huge and going worldwide because there are many bee lovers now trying to save bees that we're losing. Um, and you know, it's something, if you think about it, certainly for world peace, because it has to do with food and, and countering famine. And I mean, it has to do with so much in the world. The, so you don't have to think like, oh, I have an idea and it, it's got to go out to the world. No, you can start with it just at home, but you may be surprised to find that it, it suddenly gets its own, you know, its own strength and it goes out bigger. So let's look at, I would like to look at three people who started with ideas that they had no idea would get where they got around the world. So let's look at that. And maybe some of you recognize these people. Um, does anybody know any of these people? Just checking. Does anybody recognize them, the four, four people in the pictures? Don't be shy. But anyway, OK. So let's start on the left um, as you're looking at it. Uh, Jody Williams. Jody Williams, uh, because hers, is, well, it started, it, she started it earlier, but uh, the next one started it even earlier, but I'll tell you. In the case of Jody Williams, Jody Williams um, had been working, she had done some work with a non-governmental organization in Central America. I think it was in El Salvador in the 1980s, at the time when there was a lot of terrible things going on there. And she was became horrified, as, as I have been, was horrified when I was in Iraq, for example, or Egypt, at the numbers of landmines and how terrible landmines are. You know, they're, because in wars, um, when the, the militaries will place landmines all as much in the country that they're attacking or, or defending as, as they can. And landmines are really a horrible, horrible weapon, which you know not only kills people, but it also maims people who, who survive and they are ruined forever. So Jody Williams was in Central America. She was working, I, can't, I don't know which organization, but a non-governmental organization uh, working to help the people of Central America, of El Salvador. And then she came back in, in the early 1990s. Now, for you students, you don't, in the early 1990s, we still did not have internet. It really was sort of got uh, all over, was uh, 1994, 1995. When she started, she went home to Vermont. So she was an American from New England. She went home to Vermont. She had nothing but a little house and a kitchen, and she started writing letters 
to Congress, to people all over the world, to the UN. She just wrote the letter. She started sending them out. She began to get people interested that she was, it, she was trying to uh, start a campaign to ban landmines. Most people thought, well, you know, this is useless. Uh, landmines are everywhere. How can you do anything in any way? You're just in your kitchen in Vermont. What, what influence, what power do you have? Well, quite remarkably, before the internet, she built an international campaign. It was called, it's called the ICBL. You can find it, ICBL, the International Campaign to Ban Landmines. She got supporters all over the world, locally first, then, all, then nationally, then all over the world. She then went on to the UN. She ended up having the UN uh, come up with a, a treaty uh, uh, to ban landmines worldwide. Uh, it's, it's, it's been signed. There are what you call signatories. That's a diplomatic term. There's, the countries have signed the uh, anti-landmine legislative you know, treaty. And in 1997, she won the Nobel Peace Prize. This is the highest honor for anybody doing peaceful diplomatic work. And it's usually it's for something. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize is, is always for something in particular. Uh, in other words, if you look at history, when you look at history of the Nobel Peace Prize, I'm sure some of you have written about it. You will see that some people win the Peace Prize sometime and then they go on to do bad things or maybe they did bad things and then they get a prize anyway for something good, one good thing. Anyway, it's for one good thing. She got the award. Who was she? She was an individual, a citizen who had started in her kitchen in Vermont with an idea that went worldwide that led to a global, global ban on landmines that still exists. So I she is a citizen diplomat and she i'm certain that she did not do it just she never um, imagined that she would get a nobel peace prize when she started anyway so that's jody williams the second person wangari mathai sadly she's died now but fortunately she had not died uh, she did not die before she won the nobel peace prize if you look there you see wangari mathai um, Nobel Peace Prize in 2004. But she came from Kenya and she, and I will tell you that I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Kenya and I taught at a girls' school, my first school that I taught a secondary uh, high school uh, for girls. It was a public school, but the girls came, it was boarding. Um, and it was in her part of the country uh, on Mount Kenya. Uh, she's a Kikuyu tribe. I know I, I'm the name Wangari. I had many students named Wangari. Well, she was a housewife. She was a teacher. She, she became very concerned because her beautiful land, and it is very beautiful on the slopes of Mount Kenya, the people were chopping down all the trees and the magnificent trees there on the equator, magnificent. And so she started again in her home garden with her friends in the neighborhood in a little tiny village town. And she started planting trees and she called it the Green Belt Movement. And of course, a lot of people laughed. They said, who is this woman talking about planting trees, et cetera, et cetera. Well, she built it into a global movement. She started it in 1977. So you can see the long time it took before she was finally uh, awarded or recognized for her great work. But she built this major green movement to plant trees for reforestation, um, starting in her little plot of land and her neighborhood and her town with her friends and her students. Um, and she expanded. It went nationally in Kenya. Then it went regionally in Africa. And then it started spreading all over the world. In 2004, 
Wangari Mathai was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. So again, a citizen diplomat. I mean, I just, when I think of these people and you can imagine, she did not expect when she started planting the trees and talking to her friends about the value for the world peace, um, that this would lead to a Nobel Peace Prize. And it didn't for th almost 30 years. The, the last two in the pictures are together. Um, you might have seen them last uh, December. Uh, well, they were announced in October. They're always the Peace Prize laureates the, for the year are always announced in October. Uh, on uh, And it, it, actually, some years you don't have one if the, if the Nobel Peace Prize says, well, there's no one deserving this year. But most years you have them. And as you know, for those of you who've written about it or researched it or talked about this as history, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this is, is the biggest prize for diplomacy and peace. But these people are not, these are not professional formal diplomats. These people uh, are just regular people like us. And these two people that you see here, Dmitry Muratov and um, Maria Ressa, R-E-S-S-A, uh, Dmitry Muratov is an editor in uh, in this in Russia. I think he's had to leave his his newspaper was now closed down in the last couple of in the last few weeks months. Um, and he but he's Russian and his and the other person Maria Ressa is Filipino, and she's also has American citizenship. I happen to know that um, these people started again they were journalists they are journalists and they started going to promote the freedom of expression the freedom of press the freedom of speech and they started locally they started they did not plan they never thought i mean they wouldn't have thought that the nobel peace prize would give an award to a journalist but they and they both of these were uh, jailed at various times they were threatened uh, you know, by their governments, the Russian government and the uh, Filipino government. And, and they were also threatened, I would say, by other authoritarian regimes who don't like the idea of the freedom of the press. Um, and finally, um, last winter, uh, they won the Nobel Peace Prize together. It was given to both of them. And they were the uh, Nobel laureates for 2021. They are still working, they are still trying, they are still promoting, but each one of them had started locally, just covering the news, just trying to have freedom of the press, which is now really, it's not just from our constitution from the end of the 18th century. It's a universal value, even if nobody, I mean, as we know, even in our own country, we don't have freedom, complete freedom of the press. Uh, and so countries believe in these values now, even if they don't practice it. Uh, but at any rate, I give you these four people as examples of true citizen diplomats who never planned to get a Nobel Peace Prize. And each one of them was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in their time. So I'd like to uh, th uh, stop and see if there's any questions about this part, this section. Any questions? I don't see any hands. Oh, hey, everybody, sorry. I don't mean I don't mean to stun you all. I'm just <laughs> I hope I'm hope I'm giving you good ideas. Um, <laughs> let me just conclude before we go into the second part again. For me, citizen diplomacy, practicing global diplomacy, recognizing that what we can do locally with diplomatic efforts of reaching out. I mean, we know right now in our time that we're living in here, even in the United States, we're living in such divisive times. And I am a believer that it is possible to reach out across to different groups. We don't have to be living in at loggerheads with people. And so I would encourage you and urge you to say that we, I really believe, and I'm I'm sure that all of you by participating in this National History Day, 
that you believe that we can make a difference. And I would like to encourage you all to think of yourselves as either a citizen diplomat now or potential citizen diplomat that you can start things. They don't have to go all the way out to the world and win the Nobel Peace Prize. That would be very nice. But they can make big differences at home and nationally and abroad. So I'll thank you. And then we'll, unless there's another question, I'll go into section four. Section four, we're gonna talk about diplomacy pathways and careers. And by pathways, I'm, I'm actually uh, referring to the fact that you may not be, your, your whole life, you may not be a, an official diplomat, but you may be a diplomat uh, you, and with, with small d or whatever, or not official. And those kinds of diplomats, as we've been discussing all along, are extremely important. And I think it, that I think it's almost it, it's something that each of us should think about. But it's also to encourage you to realize you may want to be a diplomat, as as I wanted to be, and I became a diplomat. And but I also did a lot of other things in my life. And I consider that most of the other things I did in my life were different kinds of diplomacy, even though nobody called them diplomacy. So uh, that's what I want to encourage. And if we see what uh, the slides that we have here. Well, first of all, let me say that um, I was, do we want to go to that, that one? Yeah. I'm, I'm, and we can put this up there, but I want to add, and I'm going to mention this at the end also, the Association of Diplomatic Studies and Training website, ADST.org, ADST.org, has an incredible amount. It's an organization that has done the oral histories of many, many diplomats, American diplomats, including myself. They started with my birth and they went, it went till the February, uh, the month before the pandemic began in 2020. And so ADST, which is, is, is a non is a non-governmental, but it has some kinds of links with the American Foreign Service Institute. It's actually housed on the, at the American Foreign, the U.S. Foreign Service Institute. Um, but they take, uh, they have funding from, from many sources. Uh, it's not a government organization, but they are working in collaboration with the Lib U.S. Library of Congress in Washington and providing all of these oral histories that, well, there are diplomats, as I have been, that will tell the stories of their diplomatic career that you may not find in the usual history books. Some of them have written books, uh, but many of them are telling about major historic events that you would be researching, for example, and suddenly you can read about how a particular diplomat talked about it. So I just would urge you to look at that. That gives you an idea also if you want, if you study it, and there's a whole section, the student section, which we mentioned here, but if you look at it, you will start getting an idea of all the kinds of diplomacy because diplomacy is not just being a political uh, officer or economic officer. They're commercial officers. They're agricultural officers. They're public affairs officers. They're, they're science diplomats. They're business diplomats. They're management diplomats. They're people. Um, I worked in the Bureau for Oceans, Environment, and Science at the State Department for one year. I was the uh, chief of staff for the uh, assistant secretary of state. And every day I went to work, I found out a new subject that was some diplomacy, forest diplomacy, nanotechnology, uh, coral reefs, saving coral reefs of the world, space diplomacy about outer space because there have to be laws and international agreements, um, just all kinds of things. It's almost as if, if you want to be a diplomat, you, there's you, sort of the world is, is anything anything in the world can be a subject for diplomacy. So let's go to the next one.
All right. Uh, I put these up. These were just kind of random. Um, and, and, and I should have a picture of me in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it was interesting. I had gone to the airport and you and one of the things you might notice, because there's a lot of uh, stereotypes in the United States about Saudi Arabia. But you see, I'm not covered there. Of course, I have my arms covered. And but the fact is that you didn't have to be covered. And the the Saudis uh, were almost like supporting the fact that I was welcoming the U.S. Secretary of Defense, uh, William Cohen, who whom I had known him when I was a diplomatic correspondent at National Public Radio, and I used to interview him. But then some years later, I became a, an official U.S. diplomat. And the, the man behind was the Saudi ambassador in Washington. Again, I had known him in another activity of mine, which was journalism. And now I was out there in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh, as um, as, as a, a, I was actually a junior officer, but I was doing consular work and then political work and human rights work, uh, human rights diplomacy, uh, all kinds of things. And so that's just a picture. I love the picture because it, it shows the Saudis with, with me and the, and the U.S. Defense um, Secretary at the time. The others are logos that I include here. And um, if you look, the one on the, the, the WFP is the World Food Program. And I would mention the reason I'm putting these here is just they happen to be organizations that I have been connected with. But I, I, I point them out to show the variety of organizations that you could go with, you could work in, that you're going to be doing diplomacy, international diplomacy. The World Food Program is uh, in a, a major agency of the United Nations. And the World Food Program, as you may know, in 2020 was also was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And again, that was sort of unusual for the Nobel Peace Prize to go to a UN agency and this one. But the fact was, as you know, in 2020 was the beginning of the pandemic. And the World Food Program was out there trying to help feed people all over the world. Uh, and this is major. You may not have thought about feeding people as di diplomacy, that, but really, if you think of it, it's basic diplomacy, basic. And uh, so I put the World Food Program. You could name any, many, many others where you could work, UNICEF, uh, UNDP, uh, Food and Agriculture, you know, International Organization for Migration, UNHCR for Refugees, uh, the Human Rights uh, for the United Nations. And then the other one I have there is a non-governmental, which I'm actually chair of the board in the, in the United States, the Reporters Without Borders. Uh, Reporters Without Borders is an international organization headquartered in Paris, uh, in the United States, we have an office in, in Washington, D.C., and, and they appointed me to be the chair of their board because I've done so much work in journalism and, and, and all over the world and worked closely with Reporters Without Borders. And this is a non-governmental, and we, as, as a non-governmental organization, do a lot of lobbying uh, to the United States and to other countries all over the world to, to lobby for on behalf of freedom of the press and protection of journalists. And for example, last uh, September, October, when, when the UN General Assembly was going on, the Reporters Sans Frontieres, the Reporters Without Borders in Paris, the Secretary General was coming to New York for the General Assembly because you might ask, well, why would some head of a non-governmental, because it's very important to get the issues, whatever the issues are, to bring these ideas before diplomats and world leaders. And so I arranged a meeting between the Secretary General of the Reporters Without Borders from Paris. He came to New York. I arranged a meeting for him with the president of the UN General Assembly. So they met in person 
it was later when the and they they couldn't get together right then but later in, in a month or so and so he didn't have much time he had only 10 minutes to speak to the UN general assembly president but he was basically working diplomatically to get the issue on the radar big time for the UN General Assembly president and therefore for the UN General Assembly, because we want them to consider freedom of the press. So all of these, I mentioned these issues, and I'm, I'm sure it's sort of hard to follow, but the fact is, this is all diplomatic work. All of it is diplomatic work. Um, the, the other one I have there is UNITAR, United Nations Institute for Training and Research, which is the organization that one of the organizations I work for right now as a, as a teacher. And I teach courses for them worldwide online. Um, I teach certificate courses for them. Uh, and anybody can, anybody can take their courses. You can sign up, they, you have to pay them. Um, and, but they also do lots of training. They have some free, free online training. I would recommend that you look at UNITAR because especially if you're interested in any kind of diplomatic training, uh, we or the UNITAR offers training in all kinds of diplomacy and including, for example, some courses I teach on speech writing because speaking and speeches are so important in diplomacy, so basic. Uh, and those are, and I teach public diplomacy and people have, and cultural diplomacy. And I also teach UNITAR has courses that are master's degrees as well, and they do those with other international universities, including we've, they've got a new one starting with Seton Hall University in New Jersey. And I have taught with them with UNITAR and the Seton Hall, but they also, there's another one right now I'm teaching with the university in Rome and another I'm teaching with the university in Barcelona. And so, and I've taught one with the university in Brazil all through UNITAR, but I give you these as, as some to, to think about. But, so this is kind of like big picture of there are all kinds of things you can be doing. And as I mentioned, if you think of yourself as a citizen diplomat, no matter where you work, you might be having your own kind of projects that you're doing on your own, or you may feel, for example, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, which I always recommend Peace Corps, it, it, as a Peace Corps volunteer, I was really, we were, all of us are kind of like citizen diplomats because we weren't official, you know, big time uh, official US diplomats. Uh, we were separate and we, we considered ourselves, we tried to be separate from the government foreign policy per se. Um, and, because we were teachers and we worked in agriculture and we worked in uh, transportation and we worked in very grassroots, it's very grassroots work. But as I've said, we have, you know, grassroots diplomacy is extremely important. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a journalist, I, I can't, you know, I tried to be diplomatic, but I had to, I had to do my job to get my stories, but I happened to end up loving covering diplomacy in the reason which I've started mentioning from the very beginning, diplomacy is actually for a journalist, much harder to cover. It's much more complex than covering wars or just covering politics. The reason I say that is that if you cover a war or even just politics back and forth, you, you, you have a story at the end of the day or at the end of the hour. You can say something happened, this happened, so many people were killed, uh, so many people survived, uh, so many buildings were attacked. You, you, can, you can report like these facts. But if you're trying to report diplomacy, you're having to write about and think about and try to understand and get diplomats to talk to you about the nuance about the debates, about the daily work. And then the question becomes, how do you make that interesting? Um, as I said, I enjoyed it and I really loved when I was a diplomatic correspondent, but it's a very difficult uh, job. And one of the reasons is that it's 
doesn't have the drama uh, that you, you would say if you can have daily drama of a war. And of course, as we know, I mean, news is a business and news has to sell. So it's harder to, it's harder to cover. I, I was also in uh, politics uh, as a press secretary on presidential campaigns. Uh, I was a professor, I've lectured all over the world. And in each of these cases, I considered that if, if, I, look on, if I look at all these things that I've done, whether I was a teacher or uh, wherever you work, that you can be a diplomat and you can reach out. I had a, a student in one of my speech writing courses just a few, a month ago, and he's in the Middle East and he wrote me a letter the other day. And he is not an official diplomat. I think he's in some kind of international business, but he said, I want to thank you for what you taught about diplomacy and speech writing and speech giving and the power of speeches uh, for diplomacy, he said, because we had a situation, he said, of in, in where I live, and there were people were upset about children's noises. And he said, but I gave a speech following what you suggested as a diplomat to show both sides, show both sides, reach, reach consent, try to reach consent. He said, we reach consensus and everybody is happy because we reached an agreement because of the way he spoke. So um, you just don't know where you're going to be a diplomat. Now, the other point I do wanna add, and it was Nancy referred to this in the beginning, it's very important and I would urge all students, and I know some professors or some parents don't want to hear this maybe, but I will tell you that I, I encourage you, like when you're in college, you know, study and major in what you want to major in. And maybe you want to be a diplomat and maybe you want to have international, an international career, for example, but you don't have to major in international relations. You don't have to major, you don't have to study diplomacy. If you want to be a journalist, for example, you don't have to study journalism. In fact, I recommend you don't. I mean, in fact, I would recommend that you work as a journalist. My point is, is that I was an English major in college. I minored in classics, that's Latin and Greek, dead languages, classical civilization. I then went in the Peace Corps. Uh, I was a teacher in uh, secondary high schools. And then I was a teacher in primary elementary schools. Um, later, I became a university professor. So I've taught in all schools. It, and in all of those cases, I was doing diplomatic work. And the fact is when I finally joined the Foreign Service and took the examinations, I did not have to have been a major in government or political science or, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those. Those are great majors and subjects. But if you want to study something else like art or music or English or French, or math and science, all of those can lead to your being a diplomat. And I think that's very important because I think, and I'm saying this at the end of this talk, because I know that students today get a lot of pressure um, to think about majoring in or studying something that's just gonna bring them some money immediately. Well, I can assure you that your life you're probably gonna do a lot of things in your life. And I suggest and encourage you to study the things you want to study. And then if you want to be a diplomat, you can still take the exams. You can still go into the foreign service. You can still work at the United Nations with any background in the world. So this may be shocking to some of you, but I, I promise you it's true. So I'm gonna stop for the minute and see if there are any questions. Um, from any of you right now is, is and I, this this picture we have here this is beautiful this is the palais des nations the pal palace of the nations at the united nations in geneva switzerland and you can see all the flags it's very beautiful just like the flags you can see at the un headquarters in new york city which you can visit yourselves but what's interesting about this is um 
before this became the UN, this was where the League of Nations was. And you know from your history that the League of Nations unfortunately did not survive and World War II came and the League of Nations was dissolved. And then at the end in 1945, in, in, in August and September, uh, after the World War II ended, um, we had the establishment of the United Nations. Um, I'm a great believer in the United Nations, um, and I think it's important that the United Nations, as in this picture, has been built upon the League of Nations, even though that did not survive. It was an idea that sur the idea survived. So my view is that we encourage this in every way. We don't pay attention when people say diplomacy is dead. Diplomacy is not dead. It's very alive. So thank you. I'd love to get questions from you all. So I, I took off the screen share and yeah. uh, you can have everyone or you can do your view for speaker mm -hmm. and, uh, and just have uh, Liz. And uh, I do know she is uh, really welcomes your questions and uh, thoughts and, and so forth. Teachers, judges, students, are you, you can you can ask a question about the work you're actually doing, and you know how it might tie into what I've been talking about. And I'll give a concluding statement, but I would like I see Joan has a question. Well, I just have to say, Liz, how delighted I am with your follow up here at the end. Um, that gave that gave evidence to the life that you've lived. Your that life is not linear. <laughs> that there's just all kinds of little rabbit holes that we go down and experiences that come up. And I think that if the kids can take anything away from this today, it's in your life, you're, you give evidence to saying yes. yes. You, yes, I will, yes, I will do that. I, <laughs> and then you're thinking to yourself, I don't know how I'm gonna do that, but I'll do it. And that has given you just amazing experiences that we have, so enjoyed sharing and hearing about today. Well, thank, you. thank you so much for a shout out for the liberal arts because yeah, I'm that's a true. For that. Well, I'd but say liberal you. arts and sciences because it's not that we're dismissing the sciences. I mean, there, but to realize it's so much a part of diplomacy too. Thank you very much, and and of course, and I do believe this. I mean, I I can say that I've been fortunate, but I had to make my life. Um, you know, as I said, at, the, at my age, there was nothing open when I finished college for females, except, you know, only to be a secretary or teacher or researcher or nurse. That was it. Or get married. That was the main project. Um, so that um, every inch of the way, uh, I had to, I had to try different ways. And, and for example, I will give a little tip that's useful and it's kind of, it's, it's related in general to the idea of careers. But when I, as I said, as a child, I wanted to work at the United Nations because I really believed in diplomacy. I'd been in the Peace Corps. Um, I had uh, by then got a couple of master's degrees and I was in New York and I was starting, you know, I would send, a, I would send my resume and then I would try to get interviews. And everywhere I went, uh, people said, no, you're underqualified or you're overqualified, you know, and, and of course you want to cry, but you say, but somehow I knew, I don't know how I had this idea. Maybe my mother suggested it. I don't know. Um, but I said, you know, instead of crying when I was being rejected, um, I said, well, I'm so sorry, but um, would you mind to the person at the at the place and the, at the UN system is huge, as you know. I said, would you mind forwarding my resume to someone else, maybe in another agency? And after about four or five months of stomping the streets of New York City and going from one interview to another, one rejection after another, and also um, that you know, like feeling I could get nowhere. This was terrible. 
and I was ready just to give up. And then I got a telephone call and somebody said, could you come in for an interview? He had a foreign accent. I said, could you please? No, he said, could you please come in for it? And I was about to say, no, I've had it. I'm not coming, but I did, I went. And he pointed on his desk. He said, I have received your resume from three different people in the whole UN system. And I went, really? And he said, so I guess you're, 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 you're okay. And we have a job here. And it was in ECOSOC, uh, the, in social development division. And it, at that point, I was one of the very few women even to get a job and certainly a younger, a young woman. Um, but the fact was, I had asked him to forward my resume and I wrote thank you letters, by the way. Also, I wrote thank yous to all these people rejecting me. <laughs> thank you for considering me. Um, but it paid off. Anyone else? Could we, uh, let's just look, uh, if, well, I, I don't, we don't have to look, but I, I will just repeat to you because I would like you all to think about, I hope, I hope, I hope uh, that this has been very useful to you all and that it's been um, what I mentioned to Nancy earlier the, in diplomacy and official diplomacy, they use some French words sometimes. And one of them is they say that it's a, this is a tour T-O-U-R, d'horizon, D apostrophe H-O-R-I-Z-O-N uh, in French, um, tour d'horizon. That means a tour of the whole horizon. And that's what I've hoped to give you, starting with the idea of where diplomacy began. It began with human beings, the beginning of human beings. That's diplomacy. Um, and it's, it's everywhere. And I really want to encourage each of you, and I'm gonna review just, just to mention again, these four topics. The first we talked diplomacy, history, war, debate, and peace all together. They're going on all together, all the same time, always. Uh, dip the second diplomacy in the news to, to understand this incredible interrelationship. Uh, I teach whole courses on that relationship and public and cultural diplomacy. Uh, the third, of course, we talked about global diplomacy. You can look at the article I wrote, a uh, little article about global diplomacy and, and how, and at the conclusion of that article, I say, you know, citizen diplomacy is really the face of diplomacy. That's, I mean, this is citizen diplomacy, global diplomacy. This is where diplomacy really starts. And then I said, at the role of citizen diplomats and you, um, you can be a citizen diplomat. And then finally, the section that we did on pathways and careers, I've just mentioned some of my own, but I, I will tell you that when I joined the Foreign Service, passed all the examinations, the written exam, the oral examination, I had never taken a course in international relations. I had lived and breathed it. I'd never had a course in political science. I never had a course in government. I never had a course in, in diplomacy per se, but I learned it. I, I had learned all of this on my own. And I passed. And in my class of, I think there were 52 of us in the orientation class, foreign service officers in the United States and around the world are considered generalists. And the reason we're considered, we're called generalists. And the reason is, you need to be able to jump from one thing to another. You need to be able to meet all kinds of people. And so we had people who were math majors, religion majors, philosophy majors, political science, government, international relations, English, Latin. Every major imaginable was in this class. And these people have all gone and done very many different things. And they use, they operate as generalists at all times. In, in diplomacy. So I would conclude with that to encourage all of you. And if you know people did not were not able to attend this, maybe you want to suggest that they watch this, the link that you'll get, but also to tell people about it. You know, you can also start like I do, preach, preach diplomacy. <laughs> so thank you very much. 
So um, Liz is giving a commencement speech on May 7th, um, the day we have our award ceremony. Yeah. So she agreed for us to record this so that we'll be putting it on our YouTube channel and we'll be sending out the link on May 7th. So um, she'll be giving her commencement speech, but all of us here in New Jersey will have the chance. So, so if you have friends, colleagues who didn't get to come today. Um, I know, you know, they're after school and all kinds of things going on. They'll have an opportunity on uh, the afternoon of May 7th before the award ceremony. So I, I can't thank um, Liz, Dr. Colton enough for, thank for you. spending this time with us today. Um, and I thank everyone who uh, came to attend. I think our timing was good, Liz. It's <laughs> It's just now exactly six o'clock. So well, thank you. Thank you so much. All of you for your encouragement. And and um, and I hope that you're excited. I hope, you know, I just hope I want to inspire you all. You know, you can do it, but you don't have to do. It's not as, as I think it was Joan or Joan was saying, it's not a linear path. You're going to go here and there and uh, ups and downs. And most of you are going to be like me. You're going to have many careers. Don't think that you need to get a job and it's going to be the rest of your life. I mean, heavens, that would be awful, um, right, in this 21st century. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good Thank rest you. of the evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.